I'm Avery Davidson. And I'm Kristen Oaks-White. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. Well, this week we're looking back at some of the stories from this past year, and Avery, there was one that I had a little trouble making heads or tails of. Fortunately, we keep Neil Malas all around for that. He went to Vermilion Alligator Farms this year, not just to pick up alligators, but to show how a Louisiana industry is not only successful, but successfully helping to restore this homegrown original. Here at the Vermilion Alligator Farm, it's time to return these babies to the wild. It's all part of the alligator industry's sustainability, which has helped grow the population from under 100,000 to more than 2 million alligators today. Inside the facility, these luxury skins are headed to overseas destinations for luxury brands. Even with all these unusual factors, it's just like regular farming, according to Steven Segrera. When, when we started the farm, I believe my dad started with roughly 250 animals the first year. And then over the course of the next 20 years, grew it up to that, you know, 70,000, as much as 80,000 animals on the farm in a given year. Um, and it's a very cyclical, it's like cattle, it's, you know, it's like, it's farming, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a very cyclical market. Uh, you, you get very high prices for two or three years and then the crash comes and you have very low prices for several years. The alligator industry has faced some setbacks recently. The COVID pandemic has crushed demand for skins. Normally they process 60 to 70,000 skins a year. The past two years, they're down to less than half that. Uh, what we're experiencing now uh, with COVID-19 and with pan you know, the pandemic, very depressed prices, basically the market just stopped. We had something very similar in 2009 that we went through, um, but that was just a financial crisis. So everybody kind of knew how to handle it. This is a little bit different. Uh, it's a little bit tougher. Here, Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries officials make sure that every tag is correct and registered. Similar policies are in place worldwide. We're regulated, you know, from the time we collect the egg to the time we sell the skin overseas. I mean, there's there's steps all along the way that are monitored by U.S. Fish and Wildlife and or Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries. The public-private partnership isn't just about keeping the industry above board. 10% of all alligator eggs must be returned to the wild as adolescent alligators, well past the age when they suffer high mortality. That means the industry and the animals in the wild thrive. So annually, we, we give farmers permits, they collect eggs, incubate them, and when they come up, we come up with a hatch rate, they return 10% of what they've hatched at 48 inches long back to the wild. It's a sliding scale, so if it's slightly higher than 48 inches, they have to put back less. Slightly lower, uh, they, they put back more. The requirement for returning alligators to the wild size-wise is 36 to 60 inches, and she's a good one for surviving to help propagate the next generation of alligators, making this industry sustainable now and in the future. Reporting from Mouton Cove, Louisiana, I'm Neil Malasa. Since Neil's story, the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries has proposed reducing the amount of alligators returned to the wild from 10% to 5%. This is due to the success of the program, where once endangered, the alligator population is now starting to thrive. And also, be sure to check out our social media channels because there are some really funny bloopers of Neil holding that alligator, getting beaten by the alligator. Or just hold on for the end of the show. Yeah, bloopers. Hold, okay, that's in there, that's in there too. And I think there might be something that involved uh, a liquid as well. So uh, this year, we also saw the election of two new members of Louisiana's congressional delegation. Louisiana's 2nd District has a new congressman who served before in the state Senate. Representative Troy Carter, a Democrat, took office in May of this year. Earlier in the spring, Congresswoman Julia Letlow took office representing Louisiana's 5th District, filling the seat once held by Dr. Ralph Abraham. The seat was originally won by Letlow's late husband, husband, Luke, who died from complications of COVID-19 just days before he was going to be sworn in. Letlow says she's honored to hold this seat and represent the 5th District, and she could not do that without the help of the Louisiana Farm Bureau. 
I am so thankful to Farm Bureau. They have supported me from day one as far as helping me learn uh, this industry. It's no secret my background is in higher education, but I'm eager to learn about their industry. Ag is the backbone of the 5th District of Louisiana. It's an honor to serve on the Ag Committee, and I'm so thankful to the Farm Bureau for helping me be a great representative. Since taking office, Letlow has made many trips through the district, meeting farmers and ranchers and leaders in Louisiana agriculture, becoming a great ally to the industry. Letlow staff is made up of good people that Avery loves to talk about. Oh yeah, Mitch Rabelais, Ted Verrill, all those folks, Zelie Duvall, great people working in the staff there at the 5th Congressional District. You're such a name dropper. <laughs> we showed you last week the damage the winter storms in February caused across the state. Another storm we covered from many angles was Hurricane Ida that made landfall on August 29th at Port Bouchon as a Category 4 hurricane. The devastation was widespread, causing billions of dollars of damage throughout the Gulf of Mexico, Louisiana, and Mississippi. In the days after Hurricane Ida left Louisiana, the storm traveled northeast, causing severe damage in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York, and other New England states. According to the National Hurricane Center, Hurricane Ida was one of the costliest U.S. Atlantic hurricanes, with damage estimates in the ballpark of $65 billion, ranking fifth behind Hurricanes Katrina, Harvey, Maria, and Sandy. Here in Louisiana, a lot of that damage was to homes, businesses, and infrastructure like the miles and miles of power lines that were brought to the ground. The damage to agriculture was hard to miss as well as we traveled the state covering the storm. For example, in southern Lafouche Parish, many cattle were stranded and ranchers from neighboring parishes and states came to the aid of ranchers who couldn't move their cattle from the storm ravaged areas. Ray Sheremy says hay was only part of his stranded cattle's needs. Drinking water was also a concern. Those cows stayed at least four nights that they could not lay down unless they were laying down in water. Now it's starting to dry up. It's still wet, but they can lay down and not be in standing water. My biggest concern is uh, the water to drink. All that grass is rotten. The grass stinks. The water stinks. And I'm concerned that they might get sick by drinking that nasty water. The Louisiana seafood industry was hit hard by Hurricane Ida. Our friend Tammy Arnder traveled down to Jean Lafitte to see how folks in the shrimping industry would bounce back. One shrimper she spoke with says he expects fishing to be tough for the next couple of years. Further inland, timber was also hit hard by the Category 4 winds. Loose soils, heavy rains, and hurricane force winds came together to create disaster for property near La Ranger. According to property manager, the economics of replacing down timber gets really difficult following storms like Ida. Going forward is extremely expensive for the replanting, and when you don't have the income from a harvest to offset those expenses, it gets to be substantial. Other areas of agriculture damaged by Hurricane Ida include citrus in Plaquemines Parish, produce in Terrebonne Parish, and fall produce crops in the Florida parishes. Sugarcane harvest is still underway. Estimates show about 25% of the state's crop was in Ida's path, but we will not know how the storm affected yields until harvest is done in January. In the dates following the storm, sugarcane farmers could not work in their fields, so they banded together to help those in Ida's path. The first message I saw was from Mike Malone, so a friend of mine from St. Martin Parish, which is far from St. James. So other than Farm Bureau, I probably wouldn't know him as well as I do. And the message simply said, see you tomorrow morning. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Foundation Disaster Relief Fund raised more than $100,000 for farmers and ranchers in the affected parishes. Thank you to each of you who donated to help Louisiana agriculture. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. One area of Louisiana agriculture that was mostly spared from damage from the hurricane was the rice industry. Most of the state's acres were outside of the path of Ida, and about three quarters of the crop had already been harvested when the storm made landfall, according to the USDA crop progress reports. This week, many of those farmers and industry leaders gathered in New Orleans for the 2021 Rice Outlook Conference. At the conference, folks in the industry discuss issues like trade and marketing their crops and also technology. Louisiana rice farmers Richard Fontenot and John Owen spoke about the rice checkoff program in Louisiana and how it's important to to help promote Louisiana rice and fund research that's helping Louisiana farmers grow better crops each year. Speaking of rice, for the second week in a row, we mourn the loss of a champion for the Louisiana rice industry. John Dennison Sr. passed away at his home on November 30th. Dennison was a strong leader in Louisiana Farm Bureau, on the Rice Research Board, and on the national level with USA Rice. 
John Russell Dennison Sr. served as the third vice president on the Louisiana Farm Bureau Board of Directors for six years, starting in 1983, a position now held by Evangeline Parish Rice Farmer Richard Fontenot. Mr. John Dennison has been a Farm Bureau member, an active member. Uh, I think I looked at some information where he was on the Rice Advisory Committee since 1963. Uh, that's over 58 years of, of service to Farm Bureau. John was truly an advocate for the rice industry. Kyle McCann is the Louisiana Farm Bureau assistant to the president, but had previously worked with Dennison as an associate commodity director. It was there the two tackled politics on the national and state levels. John enjoyed it. He, he loved the uh, political process, and he advocated relentlessly on behalf of Louisiana rice uh, and the USA rice industry. One thing about John, you were never in doubt of where, where he stood. Uh, he was very forceful, uh, he, he was very decisive, uh, and uh, he really fought for the, the positions that he had. His strong point was the lobbying. You know, he did some fabulous things, and he left behind a conservation program, uh, some good safety net measures in our farm bills, that he and some of his colleagues of that generation started and, and, and created years ago that we're still using today. John Dennison was 86 years old. Welcome to Field to Feast, where we profile Louisiana and its local ingredients. Today, we're at Crawfish Town USA in Henderson. We're going to head inside to speak with owner Johnny Abair all about holiday shopping the market. Then head into the kitchen where we'll make a dish using delicious Louisiana ingredients, crawfish and rice. Field to Feast with Jennifer Finley is brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat. And by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Beef, it's what's for dinner. And by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board. Think rice. <laughs> Well, we are very blessed because today we are at Crawfish Town USA with Johnny Bear, the owner, and he's going to give us all the lay of the land because I have been past here, everybody has, and it, what's going on in there? I mean, it stands <laughs> out in the topography for sure. It's certainly unique. Uh, I, not too many restaurants are set inside of a, a, a historic uh, structure like this, so it's, it's pretty pretty cool to, to see. It's got a great a great feel. Uh, definitely feels like Louisiana. Uh, and we stick close to Louisiana foods. We, we source the majority of our products locally. Of course, crawfish is a staple here. So uh, all of our crawfish are from the, the, the immediate area. So you <clears throat> purchased yes. in 2005 Crawfish Town. Yes. Why? And, uh, I don't know. It just felt right. <laughs> Crazy, a, right? But it was definitely a, a good move. It was a good move for it's us. It's a calling, though, because when yeah. I was, you know, kind of reading up on it, it really feels like, yes, this is a passionate place. It's grown yeah. It's grown with passion, and mm. passion continues to grow it further. Yeah. I mean, when it when it came up for sale, we um, I, had, I had been familiar with the place since I was a kid. I worked here as a kid. So, I, I don't know, it just felt like the right thing to do. Um, the plan initially was to get it up and running and maybe uh, flip it, sell it, and uh, we fell in love with the project and here we are. So describe your market to me because I am absolutely infatuated with your market and anytime I'm passing here, I stop by <laughs> for the scratch biscuits. I guess the market became, um, the first thought for the market was that it would be a place for me to process my own fish and peel my own crawfish and those, those kind of things. That was a little bit more challenging, but the idea was that while we're doing that, we'll will also sell this fresh seafood uh, because we have we have to have so much of it and we we had the ability to sell it fresher than most markets because we were constantly producing and you know buying and moving product um, it kind of just grew into um, being a lot more than that we, we started making our own boudin started making our own crackling added a drive-through so it's be, it's become a really convenient place for people to grab uh, fresh shrimp, fresh catfish. Uh, lots of our, our our own recipes are sold in the market for people to take home and heat and serve kind of thing, or just 
you know, compile our pre-made stuff with fresh stuff and kind of create their own meal quickly. Um, so it's been a nice, uh, you know, project for, I guess, about the last eight years. Um, a great addition to Crawfish Town USA's restaurant. So, so talk to me about your chef. Our chef is a... Uh, a little bit quirky, kind of, kind of has an attitude most of the time. I um, love that. She thinks she's a princess. Um, she acts and talks and walks like a princess, but she has great ideas. Uh, she's a great um, a creator of, of great dishes with our uh, local local foods. So I guess she, the surprise is always there. She's always uh, creating new dishes. Every week she puts out a chef special on Thursday and it's our favorite day of the week here because we have live music and, and new dishes from Chef. So she is a, a very interesting character. <laughs> well, I will be here on Thursday, but for now, we're gonna take you back into the kitchen to meet Chef and make up a delicious dish using local Louisiana ingredients. Crawfish Town USA in the kitchen with Chef Johnny Gale and she's going to make us a festive Christmas dish today. What are we going to be doing? Um, we're making some popcorn rice with Louisiana rice and some barbecued crawfish tails over it. So it's like our version of crawfish and grits. Okay, so we got our grits going. They're almost done. So in our grits, we started with our Louisiana rice. We and did. What did we do? We do a cup of rice, three cups of chicken broth. Okay. Um, two tablespoons of butter mm. and uh, like a fourth of a teaspoon of cayenne okay. and you get that boiling and reduced down so it the texture feels it's, like a grits it's, it's but almost, it's a rice yes it's almost gonna be like a risotto almost i love it it's real creamy and so all of my favorite flavors so far butter cream and then we're gonna add a little bacon butter and bacon yes so we want we want to get some of that bacon bacon fat rendered out of there. And we have some of our uh, alkalis. Yes, uh, smoked sausage. Smoked sausage from Bray Bridge. Oh. Local, yeah, local sausage. Yes. Local sausage, and you can get this in the market. Yes, you can get this in the market. You can get um, a lot of the local products that I use, we sell in the market. And now we're gonna add a half a cup of diced tomato. All right. So far, I'm still with you. <laughs> Oh, what? See, those are Christmas colors. Yeah. I mean, fall, la, 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 yes. la. Yes. We'll add our say is towel. Okay. This is, that's the greatest thing I've yes. ever heard of. And that's just going to... It's just going to enhance. It's your onion, onions, bell peppers, celery, and garlic, and red bell peppers in there. It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's the same way if you would use a spice. Yes. This, that's amazing. Yes. And that's in the market as well? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Stocking stuffers. <laughs> I know. I'm shopping on my way yes. out. Okay, now we're going to deglaze this. You might want to step back. Oh, the, yes. last, the last man that did this. Four steps forward. <laughs> so we're going to add a little wine, deglaze the bottom of that pan, get oh, all that good great. stuff out. We're going to bring that to a bowl. Yes, I do know somebody that burned their eyebrows off doing that. <laughs> yes. And All these right. are our local crawfish. Which you have, have to have at Crawfish Town. Of course. Yes. And we got some uh, my homemade blackening season. So delicious. Oh, my word. Chef, that looks great. Is it ready for us to yes, plate up? Yes, we're ready to plate it. Awesome. Let's taste it. All right. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. So it's time to plate up? Yes, ma'am. All right. What are we calling this? So this is our rice grits made with Louisiana rice, which you can see the texture. Oh, my it's gosh. smooth and creamy, it's just like grits would be. It is a lot like a risotto, yes. too. Yes, it is. Uh, the texture is like risotto, kind of. Um, but you have the flavor, the corn flavor, the popcorn rice, and so it's gonna taste a lot like grits. Oh, I'm ready. I know, and Keep then, going. 
So we have our rice grits, and now we have our barbecued crawfish oh my that we're going to put on top. They said that on Thursdays you do a new dish every Thursday. I do a new dish every weekend, oh, and they start Thursday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday. Is this going to be this weekend? Um, this will be this weekend. Ooh, yes. you heard it here yes. first. And of course, we always want to use our um, local microgreens just to add a little bit of color. They're and now so pretty. it's really looking like yes. Christmas. Yes. There's your Christmas dish. All right. Can we taste it? Of course. I have never been so excited to taste something. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I have to get everything. Chef, is this the most favorite thing you've ever made? Mm -hmm. It has to be. Pretty much. Oh, my goodness. This is so delicious, everyone. You need to come see Chef Donnie here at Crawfish Town USA. And for all the recipes that you've seen on Field to Feast, you can visit us at twilighttv.org. Merry Christmas, everyone. Field to Feast with Jennifer Finley is brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat. And by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Beef, it's what's for dinner. And by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board. Think rice. You can never go wrong with crawfish and rice. And you know what crawfish season? Right around the corner. Get ready, folks. I can't wait. Well, this week's show is our last new show of 2021. Beginning next week, we'll replay a few of our favorite shows from the past year as we begin prepping for a brand new year of Twyla with some new exciting stories and shows to share with you. Until then, you can keep up with us online at twilatv.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You'll also find all of these stories and more from our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications. That way you know when we put something out there. So to close out this show and the year of Twyla, we're leaving you with a few laughs at our expense. We hope you enjoy a few of our favorite bloopers from the past year. For all of us here at Twyla, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. We hope you have a joyous and prosperous new year. Hi, I'm Avery Davidson. And I'm Avery Davidson. Bye. And she's a good size one for returning for fighting me. <laughs> Let me get her around. There we go. Now listen here, Neil. Let me get her. <laughs> I didn't have a good grip. <laughs> <laughs> what about this is natural for me? What does this even mean? I, I think I'm insult. I think I'm insulted. Am I insulted? <laughs> The requirement for a turn. <laughs> for the love of God. <laughs> I mean, what's a hamburger without a beer? <laughs> a dry hamburger. <laughs> Chicken without an egg. Buck, buck. Buck, buck, buck. Really? Ready? Three? How's my, how's my face look? Does it look even? Three, two. Talking about ABBA, name the first Swedish that band I mean to win a Grammy. Mm, ABBA. That's what most people think. I don't know. It's Ghost. Put that in my back pocket if I ever get on Jeopardy one day. That's exactly, exactly. For returning to the wild to help it survive. Ah, come on. We have been through this before in Louisiana and we will certainly go through it again. It's just part of what Cummings and this, it's. While it's Quist, Quiston Oaks White, let's take it from there. While it's Quist, why can't I say Kristen Oaks White? Quiston. Twilight's Quiston. Twilight's Quist. Are you kidding me? <sighs> mm -hmm. No, ma'am. Okay. Not happy. Holiday. Holiday. It's a holiday shop. We're going to do this one more time. Avery never messes up. Avery always messes up. <laughs>